Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to see all your beautiful faces. I'm so, so, so grateful to be here. My name is Shreya Chaudhary. I'm a student organizer from UC Berkeley, and I also run a nonprofit called Project Planet, dedicated to building decolonial climate education. It's truly, thank you. It's truly such an honor to be here with you all today. I wanted to start by asking you a question. When you drink tea, what does it mean to you? Maybe you're thinking about your favorite type of tea, Earl Grey to start the day, chamomile to unwind at night, or maybe you think about who you're sharing the tea with, like boba on a day out with friends, or cups of chai around the dining table with family. For many of us, tea carries us through our days and is woven into the fabric of our lives. But how often do we think about the hands that make it? I come from generations of tea farmers in Dibrugarh, Assam, a region in India once crowned the tea capital of the world. So for me, a cup of tea is beyond a daily ritual. It holds a story steeped in time. Each sip transports me back to my family's tea farm, but it also makes me think of how colonization, capitalism, and the climate crisis have shaped and shaken their lives. While today, India might be known for chai, this wasn't always the case. Tea plantations and monocrops that drive the current Assamese economy were imposed by the British in the early 1800s to compete with China's reigning tea industry at the time. Thousands and thousands of acres of lush forests were cut down, and a brutal system of indentured labor bound Indians to the land, cultivating a crop they couldn't consume. It was deeply unnatural. Plantations didn't exist pre-colonially. There's not even a word for it in my language. After decades of British exploitation, my grandfather's grandfather, Harish Bakchi, became the first Indian tea farmer in Eastern India. In the wake of the 1857 Sepoy Mutiny, one of India's largest anti-colonial uprisings, Bakchi, a prominent lawyer, reclaimed land from the British as his form of freedom fighting. He abolished indentured servitude and rebuilt the local economy. But today, rampant corporatization, land grabs, and accelerating climate change proves that tea farming is still dangerous, revealing that colonial cycles never left. And this story isn't unique to just tea. It's palm oil plantations in Indonesia, cobalt mines in the Congo, luxury developments in Hawaii, lithium extraction in Chile, and ongoing land grabs across the United States. The places may change, the resources may differ, but the story remains the same. Land stripped, ecosystems destroyed, communities enslaved and murdered. And this isn't just a coincidence. It's a global system built on the same strategies of empire. Colonization enforced the mindset that environments and communities are expendable in pursuit of profit. And this is why the stories that we tell and who gets to tell them matter. Growing up in a family of land tenders and farmers, I heard stories of resilience, of respect, of land as beyond an economic resource. But the dominant narratives in the world tell a different story. One where tea is just a product on a supermarket shelf, disconnected from the people and histories rooted in it. Through colonial linearity, we feel as though only our existence now matters, not the people before or after us. The global supply chain has been invisibilized to separate us from the consequences of consumption. <laughs> Colonization breeds a lack of respect for people, for land, for life. Given that this is the root, the climate crisis is not just economic or physical, it is a spiritual crisis at its core. To break the colonial project of dehumanization and separation, we have to find what unites us. Decolonization is about restoring love and returning to cyclic ways of being. In India, there is a philosophy, Vasudevai Kutumbakam. It means the world is one family, our collective home. And in a family, we don't always agree, 
but we still show up for each other. We lend a hand, an ear, a heart. We must learn to sit with discomfort, with complexity, to engage in difficult conversations, even when we don't see eye to eye. Because colonization doesn't just live on in laws and policies, it lives on in our minds. And if our thinking remains colonized, the systems of oppression will continue. We need new stories, new technologies, new structures for true liberation. We have to go beyond Western ways of knowing. For too long, only certain ideas, such as Western science, have been taken seriously, while others, deeply rooted in indigenous science and ancestral wisdom, have been silenced and delegitimized. When I first came to Berkeley, I was struck by how environmental justice and TEK were often treated as footnotes in the classroom. The limitation of this knowledge and of professors of color leads to a lack of diversity of climate solutions. An education without diversity can become indoctrination. So that is why I founded and teach the class Decolonizing Environmentalism, a space where communities of color can reclaim our narrative and center our lived experiences and knowledge, not through tragedy, but through strength, memory, and resistance. <laughs> I also lead the Decolonial Environmental Network to create a culture and space on campus that furthers this work. And through my nonprofit, Project Planet, I'm trying to expand climate solutions by uplifting indigenous knowledge systems rooted in unity, multiplicity, and collective care. It is easy to hold on to separation, to retreat into division, to let exhaustion take over. But we are all fighting in our own way, not just in the streets, not just on the screens, but in the dirt on the land, in quiet resistance, in our daily choices, in the care we offer one another. Resistance is not always loud or glamorous. Sometimes it is simply the refusal to let go of connection. My aunt and uncle in Assam continue the unfinished anti-colonial radical dream of my ancestor, Harish Bakhchi, by resisting corporatization on their family farms. Indigenous communities around the world are fighting back. The Bhagavad Gita says, action itself is sacred, regardless of outcomes, so we continue to act and fight in any way we can. In this picture above, my family's tea brand, Sip, sits alongside corporate tea brands in supermarket shelves, and in that, there is resistance and hope. There is always hope, as long as we act together. I leave you with the words of writer Arundhati Roy. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. This is more information about our work. Thank you so, so much for having me.